goodness and how you set me free.
Hallelujah, Jesus. of your mighty love, my comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let every breath Just in praise to the 
Lift up our vision. There's fire falling from the sky, and it's Holy Ghost fire all over the face of the earth. The fire is spreading, it's a fire of God, it's a fire of justice. It's a fire of mercy, it's a fire of glory. just God, who is a holy God, who is the one true God, the Lord God Almighty, Lord God Almighty, Lord God Almighty, oh, I could see him coming, 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 and my heart gift today we claim fire we want, for fire we plead, send the fire, the fire will meet every one of our needs, oh Jesus send the fire.
chapel, I want you to listen. There's a verse that Lyndall just sang. The revolution now began. I'm going to tell you something. Jesus Christ is going to turn this nation upside down. He's going to take this nation and I know I know we have folks from all over the world here, but I want to tell you, we got a burden for this country too. We got a burden for your country, but we want to see this nation change. And what we're seeing, we've had 2.5 million people come through here, and that's not a whole lot. How many here, this is your first week of revival? Lift your hand high. Okay? Let me tell you, we've had, we've had a lot of folks come through here, and they've come from rich and poor families. They've come from every ethnic background. It's been a mix of people from all over this nation, and we're hearing the same thing, the same thing. Send revival or we die. Every, you heard the denominations. You heard Baptists. We've had Methodist pastors baptizing up there. You heard Baptists being baptized in there. We have Episcopalians, Presbyterians working on our prayer team. You, it's a mixture, friend. And all the way across the board, people are saying, send revival. Turn this nation around, Jesus. Turn it around. Lord, it's going to take fire. It's going to take fire. It's going to take fire, Lord. It's going to take fire, Lord. It's going to take fire, Lord. John, to bring that man in there. It's gonna take your fire, Lord! Fire. It's gonna take your fire! of sin to bring the light and glory in the revolution now begin sin
Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Just do it, Jesus. Come down. We're going to let you be seated in just a second, but I'm, I'm going to, some of you here, listen. I know in a crowd like this, you hear a lot of screaming, and you, you, you think, well, everybody's doing this. You know, everybody's screaming. Not everybody's doing it. There's some folks here that are troubled by this. They're troubled. And uh, let, me, let me share with you something about um, Christianity. There's no, um, there's no temperature in Christianity but hot. See, there's, if you're lukewarm, if you're lukewarm, he'll spew you. If you're cold, you ain't going to make it, period. So there's one temperature, and that's hot. And so fanaticism, it is absolutely normal. It is absolutely normal to be screaming out after revival. It's absolutely normal to cry out to God with your voice and lift it up and say, Jesus, send it down. That's normal. You may be seated. Let me remind you of something else as you're finding your seats. How many believe one day they're either going to get raptured or die? Every one of us are leaving out of here one way or the other. Something's going to happen. And everyone, listen to me, folks, everybody's going to live forever. Everybody. It's where you live forever. That is a crucial question. Where are you going to live forever, in hell or heaven? What's happening in this revival? I love it. I love what's going on here. God is igniting people. He's saving folks. You hear, you hear in the baptismal every Friday night. This is just a sampling of people that come forward. We have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds that come forward every night and all week of the revival. But this is just a sampling of the people. So you get a cross-section of what God's really doing here. But what I see happening in the church, look this way, folks. What I see happening in the church is crucial for the day we're living in. See, if we don't have revival in this nation, this nation's going down. This nation's going down, friend. Corruption, you look at world history and the place we're at, there's one way or the other. It's either a spiritual revival or anarchy, rebellion. You watch, now listen to me, folks. If what the economists are saying is true, and a lot of economists are in agreement, we're not talking Christian economists, we're just talking economists, are in agreement that something, a major catastrophe is on its way to the United States. If that happens, and the bottom falls out of this nation, you're going to find out how saved this nation is. This nation, and the condition it's in right now, there will be anarchy in the streets, friend. You'll find out who your neighbor is. Remember what happened with Rodney King out in California? Remember that one little situation, how that exploded and ignited? And people were killed, people were slaughtered, robbed, stores were robbed. You ain't seen nothing. I said, you haven't seen anything. If the bottom drops out of this nation and suddenly millions of Americans are out of jobs, immediately they're fired. Companies, huge corporations shut their doors. You're going to find out. You're going to see what this nation is made of. Before that happens, we need revival. It'll change everything. Yeah, have mercy on us, Lord. You know what's so sad is that people have to get so low before they come to Jesus. Wouldn't it be something that the nation turned to Jesus before a catastrophe? Wouldn't that be awesome? Before, before it happened, they turned around. Wouldn't that be awesome? Like Nineveh turned around before the judgment came down. Wouldn't that be something? Well, there's something going on here tonight. In the chapel, let me tell you, the power of God's all over that chapel. You know it is. God's here. Those of you that are listening at home, listening by live radio, those of you on the Internet, God's in the house tonight. He's moving mightily tonight. The power of God's here. He is powerful. 
He is powerful to deliver. Whatever you're struggling with, he can set you free. I'm telling you, whatever you're struggling with, be it stale, dry religion, be it a, a totally oblivious attitude towards who Jesus is. You don't know who he is. He's here tonight to reveal himself to you. Tonight, you can be struggling with alcoholism, drug addiction, pornography, serious lust. He's here to deliver you, friend. See, one of the things that you're going to deal with in this revival is um, we got a pretty closed mind when it comes to stuff like this. We know. You can come to me and say, God will never deliver me. We know he will. And see, I, I don't care the, of the skeptics, of the critics. They can stand all day long and just holler at me and scream at me that Jesus won't do it. I've seen too much. See, I'm spoiled. I've seen too much. I've seen too many miracles. And after a while, you get spoiled. After a while, you just know that you know that you know that God can do it. He can set you free. A young man came just a few months ago, stood right here, and he, and he pulled up his sleeve, and he had tracks all up and down his arm and, and knots all over his arm from running up drugs. And he looked at me, and he said, Preacher, he said, can God help me with this? And I had him, I pulled up my sleeve, and I had him feel a knot on my arm of where I'd, I was running up morphine years ago when I was a drug addict. I was running up morphine, and I went straight through the vein, and I pushed the morphine in, and it coagulated in there. And it became solid, and it's, it's like a, a half-inch rock in my arm right now. From 25 years ago, it's still there. And I said, I want you to feel that. And he took his finger and rubbed it around. He knew exactly what it was. I didn't say a thing to him. He just rubbed it around. And he looked at me and goes, you've been there. I said, he's done it for me. He can do it for you. He set me free. He can set you free. And after, friend, after you've experienced it, you have that kind of faith that God can do a work. Well, we're going to do something right now before we go any further. This is something I never do in the revival. So this is, uh, this is uh, I've done this before, but not for our particular ministry. But we're going to take up an offering right now. I don't want anyone to take out their checkbook or their wallets or their purses. I just want you to listen. I never do this on a Friday night. This will probably be the only time I do it. But pastor usually comes up. He was unable to make it tonight. But I want to talk to you just for a minute about what's going on in this place. This revival is a lot bigger than what's going on in this room right here. It's all over the world. If you could see the mail, the emails that we attempt to answer and the phone calls, that we, we, we listen to all day long of revival breaking out all over the world, but also, friend, the power, the healing power breaking out. Pastors are calling and writing from all over the world. Laymen are calling and saying miracles are taking place. It's, it's powerful. There's a move of God going on. But let me tell you another area that it's reaching that many of you don't know about, and I want to, I want to instruct you on it tonight. Before I came to the Brownsville Revival, I was a missionary. I'm still a missionary at heart. I love missions. I said, I love missions. When, when somebody gets up in that baptismal pool and starts speaking any language but English, I'm a basket case. I melt inside because that's where I've spent the last 12 years of my life. I love missions. I love being on the foreign soil. I'm fluent in Spanish, but I've worked in Russia, worked in other nations of the world. And when you get around it, friend, you can't get enough of it. I've spoken in places where people have never known the gospel. And it's, it's awesome to see the crowds come to Jesus and watch them cry when you're explaining the cross for the first time. They've never heard it before. And they ask questions like, you know, what is a Holy Spirit? Y'all hear me? What is a Holy Spirit? I remember a lady asked that to me one night in Russia. She said, what's a Holy Spirit? I'm going, wow. This is virgin territory. She knows nothing about God. What is a Holy Spirit? And so we've done that. We work all over the world. And as this revival continues, I want everyone to listen up in the chapel. As it goes on, this is, we're in our fourth year of revival. No one knows how long this thing's going to go on. And we, we usually can tell how healthy the revival is by how many are visiting for the first time. And every week, thousands of people come here. But it, you, can, you can look, sometimes it's 75% of the people raise their hands if they're here for the first time. And so we know that God is mightily moving, that a lot of people are hungry, and so we're going to go as long as God wants it to go. We're going to, I mean, that's just, if anybody ever asks you how long it's going to go, just say whatever, you know, you know, who knows? I don't know. Um, my life is his, and we'll preach until he wants us to stop preaching here. We'll do whatever he wants us to do. But while we're here, I asked God to help me on something. At the very beginning, I asked John Kilpatrick, as an evangelist, most evangelists that hold revival meetings 
there's a lot of pastors here that will validate this. They usually take up the offerings and they get the offerings. Okay, and I preach every night of the revival. So basically the offerings could go into my hands, except Wednesday night and Sunday morning, that goes to the church. But I chose at the beginning of the revival to take one offering a week for our ministry. I said, Pastor, this thing is astronomical. The costs, the lights, the air conditioning, the guards watching the cars. So the, all the other offerings can go to the church. And also to expand, build parking lots. They had to buy houses to tear them down just so you can park your car. So all that has to be done. So we decided to take up one offering on Friday nights to sustain together in the Harvest Ministries. And the offerings have been good. They've been good. God has blessed. You've given. You have given. But let me tell you some of the things that we've been able to do with it. We've been able to plant teen challenge centers around the world, international teen challenge centers. Now, folks, I, I'm a church planner. We got some missionaries. Brad Morris is here tonight. Wave at me, Brad. Brad and Cheryl. Y'all stand just a minute. I want you to give them a hand. These are missionaries. He's been with us in some of our projects and, uh, and knows what I'm sharing with you is, is true. We plant churches. We plant teen challenge centers. Uh, around the world but God has given us the opportunity with the Friday night offerings sure it helps that helps pay our staff and we help to to take care of the ministry the home base but we're able to send tens of thousands of dollars around the world and uh, it's it's phenomenal we're able to start the first teen challenge center in Colombia Colombia is the most dangerous nation to the United States you can talk all you want to friend about about nuclear warfare you can talk about what Iraq has and what these other nations have concerning nuclear arms. I'm not concerned about that. We have a military that can help take care of that. But our nation could fall not by nuclear arms. Our nation's going to fall by undermining the drug, the drug culture coming in and sweeping up our kids. And so how do you stop that? I believe in the Say No to Drugs campaigns. I believe in going into the schools and educating the kids. But why not go to the source? Why not go to the source? Why not go to the places that, that are fabricating it? And see, I'm a believer in this kind of stuff. I believe you can change a nation. I believe you can change a city. I believe you can turn a cartel around. I believe it because I've seen too many people saved. I've seen the big wheels saved. I've seen major cart narcotic runners saved. I've seen major dealers saved. So we planted a teen challenge center right in the heart of Columbia. And already they've got 15 young men in the program. Most of them were drug runners. These young men are already, you know what they want to do? They don't want to come live in the United States. They don't want to go to Venezuela. They don't want to go to Brazil. They want to stay right where they are. Where they are. What do they want to do? They want to enter the ministry. What do they want to do in the ministry? They want to preach the gospel in the streets. Where do they want to go? What do they, they want to win the cartels. They want to win their drug friends. You think about it. You start with 15, and we'll be moving up to 50 soon. We're fixing to buy a farm down there. Move up to 50 students. You train them. These are not passive church members. These are on fire young men. They'll give their lives for the gospel. You take 50, then 100, 150, 200, and they're all infiltrating the drug culture. After a while, it starts to make sense. People start getting saved. They start spreading the gospel among their ranks. We have a young man that works in our ministry. His name is Milton. He was saved in one of our crusades in Colombia. Milton came in our crusade in Colombia, came in the tent. I'll never forget him walking in. I looked at him. And I knew that God had a plan for that young man's life. What I didn't know is that his dad was a killer for the mafia. He was an assassin. And his dad had been murdered. His dad had been killed. Milton wanted, he wanted to grow up and become a killer. That's all he wanted to do in life is kill. He came to our crusade. He got saved. He got so saved, so on fire for God, he began helping us on the streets. And now, that was in 1992. Now, he's a student at the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry right now, training for the ministry. Let me tell you, friend. That's an example. Milton, are you here tonight? Is he here? He may be over in the chapel. But that is an example. Look this way. That is an example of how you can turn it around. We have a young man with us tonight. First, I want Bob Rogers to come. He's a, uh, you want you to come with me? Uh, Jose Diaz. Uh, where are you at, brother? Donde estas? Vení, hermano, por un ratito. This man, we have helped start the first Teen Challenge Center in San Salvador. And this guy, I want to tell you, in just a few minutes, we're going to take up an offering, okay? 
And I want to challenge everybody here and everyone in the chapel. If you have a problem with giving, you got a serious problem. You got a serious problem. Well, how do I know you're doing what you're doing? I'll give you the direction. You can hop on an airplane and go see the places, friend. We've challenged everybody. You can go see the churches, see the Teen Challenge Centers. Live there if you want to. This is flesh and blood. These are real projects really going on. And they come to the meeting. Larry Art, Larry Stan right tonight. Larry is here. He, he's working in Belarus. He'll talk to you about the Teen Challenge Center we planted in Belarus. Russia needs more Teen Challenge Centers. For those of you that don't know what Teen Challenge is, it is a Christian drug rehab program. They train up warriors. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a product of Teen Challenge. I graduated from Teen Challenge back in 1976. But Jose, yo quiero que nos, nos hables un poquito de lo que, lo que pasó en tu vida, cómo recibiste a Cristo y qué está haciendo ahora Dios en tu vida. Está bien, sabe que yo fui un traficante de droga en los Estados Unidos. I was a drug dealer in the United States. Nosotros en meses vendíamos millones de dólares. In just a few months, we would sell millions and millions of dollars in drugs here in the United States. Yo estaba encargado de cuidar las drogas y el dinero. I was in charge of guarding the drugs and the money. Me quedaba con 50 kilos de cocaína. And at one time, I was sitting on 50 kilos of cocaine. Folks, if you don't understand what that is, that is a pile of money right there. A veces con 300 mil dólares en efectivo en el apartamento. I'd be sitting there with 50 kilos of cocaine and 300,000 dollars in my hand. Pero fíjate que en esa vida... Eh, me habían hablado de Jesucristo, de que Jesucristo podía cambiar mi vida y transformarme. But somebody had spoken to me, even as I was in the midst of drug addiction, that Jesus Christ loved me and he could change my life. I hope everybody's listening. I hope, I hope you're not hard. Don't be hard. Open up and listen, man. This is real. This is real stuff. This is real stuff. Sabe que estuve varias veces al borde de la muerte. I was many times I was right at the border of death. Eh, en una ocasión yo mismo me iba a matar con una pistola. At one time I was even going to kill myself with a pistol. Y otra vez por una sobredosis de droga. And another time I was overdosing on drugs. Pero eh, yo ahora entiendo que Dios tenía un propósito con mi vida. But now I've understood that God had a plan for my life. Yeah. 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 Sabe, Esteban, que eh, cuando me oraste por mí ahorita ahí atrás, sentí algo muy poderoso y especial de parte de Dios. A few minutes ago when you prayed for me behind, we were in the pastor's lounge, he said, I felt the power of God come all over me. Y quiero decirte que en esa vida de drogadicción, La última vez que me vi al borde de la muerte, me estaban torturando, eh, poniéndome plancha caliente, que, que mi piel se, se pegaba a la plancha. Me enterraron un destornillador, me rompieron la cabeza con una pistola. He's talking about one time uh, in the drug addiction when, it, when he, was being, he was being beaten up and a hot iron was being pressed against his flesh and he was, he was being beaten over the head. Mi sangre corría por aquel apartamento. Porque... My, my blood was all over the apartment. Yo era de la persona que siempre, cuando no tenía una ametralladora, tenía un mano un 357 o una pistola 45. He said, I always carried a pistol with me. Me subía a los rufos, a las terrazas en los Estados Unidos a tirar tiro. I, I went up to the top of the roof. Pero déjame decirte que ese día en ese apartamento no tenía ningún arma. Fui a descansar porque teníamos varios apartamentos para evitar que nos asaltaran o que la policía nos tomara con las drogas. And he said, at that particular time, I went back down, and I went to an apartment. I had several apartments, and went to an apartment just to sit there. He didn't know what was going on in his life. Pero ese día entraron a un apartamento donde yo estaba descansando y no tenía ningún arma, y allí eh, me amarraron y comenzaron a torturarme. It was at that place a man came in. And they started to torture him. Yo sabía que me iban a matar. And he knew that someone was going to kill him. Y yo quiero decirte, Esteban, que a la hora de la muerte no hay un hombre que no tema. I want you to understand that the, when your time of death comes, there's not a man alive that doesn't fear. A no ser que tenga Jesucristo en su vida. If he doesn't have Jesus Christ in his life, every man fears. Y yo te digo que yo ahí estaba temblando y temeroso y sabía que ya me iban a matar porque ya me habían puesto la pistola en la cabeza. Estaba sangrando, estaba torturado. I was, I was dying. They, they had a pistol in my head. I was bleeding everywhere and I knew I was about to die. Y de la manera que me estaban torturando, yo sabía que era para matarme. And the way they were torturing me, I knew it was over. I was going to die. 
Pero, pero recordé que me habían hablado de Jesucristo. But I remembered that someone had spoken to me about Jesus. De que hay un Cristo que puede transformar y cambiar a la persona. That there was a Jesus that can transform you. Y mientras estaba en, en, el, en el suelo, solamente veía mi cadáver que mi madre lo estaba recibiendo en República Dominicana. And I remember I was, I was laying on the floor. Pero en ese momento recibí al Señor y le dije, Señor, en esta hora yo me arrepiento por haberte rechazado y te pido perdón. I was laying on the floor dying and I said, Jesus, right now I ask you to come into my life and change me forever. Yo te recibo, yo te recibo como mi Señor y como mi Salvador. I receive you as my Lord and Savior right now. Mira, y tan pronto confesé esas palabras, yo sentí un fuego que comenzó a entrar por mi cabeza. Soon as... Yeah. As soon as I said these words, I felt fire come all over my body. Y déjame decirte que el hombre que hacía segundo atrás estaba temblando y temeroso porque sabía que le iban a matar. Ahora, the, the man that was standing that was gonna, that was killing me was standing, he was, he was trembling as it, what was going on. Cuando el Espíritu de Dios vino sobre mi vida, sentí una valentía tan grande. When the power of God came over my life, I felt the power come into me. Y no sé de dónde salieron las palabras que pronuncié, pero sí dije, Señor, ya estoy listo, me puede llevar. And he said, I don't know where the strength came from, but I said, Jesus, I'm ready to go. Sentí una valentía, pero yo te digo que yo me avergüenzo hoy en día de hablar de esa vida, porque esa era la obra que el diablo hacía en mi vida. Pero yo quiero dar unas palabras de lo que Dios ha hecho en mi vida. Y yo doy gracias a Dios por tu vida y por la vida de cada uno de ellos. Porque hoy en día, por la gracia del Señor, soy un pastor ordenado y director de Team Channing en El Salvador. He said, I want to thank you for your life, Steve, and for everyone's life here, that now I am a pastor, and I'm, I'm, I'm the director of the Team Challenge in San Salvador, El Salvador. Y quiero darle la gracia a tu vida y a cada uno de los hermanos que están aquí. I want to thank everyone in this place. Porque gracias a ustedes, Dios está soportando completamente ese ministerio. Because of you, God is completely supporting our ministry there in San Salvador. Estuvimos cuatro años trabajando en Paraguay. I was working for four years in Paraguay. This is another program we support with tens of thousands of dollars. Donde por la gracia de Dios ya dejamos dos pastores y dos directores de ministerio allí en el Paraguay juntamente con Ronnie Hart. We've left two directors and two other pastors with that work there. Hay uno que predica la palabra en la radio de lunes a viernes, donde Dios está haciendo milagros preciosos. They preach over the radio and God's working miracles there. God's, we're doing evangelism in the streets. Y déjame decirte que después de estar en El Salvador, por la gracia de Dios, a través de la vida de ustedes, en seis meses, Dios ha levantado la oficina, nuestro hogar, que vivimos con ellos, junto con mi esposa. He said, in six months, since you folks began to help us, God has given us a place, he's given us a home, he's given us an office in San Salvador, in six months. Y tenemos 11 jóvenes. We have 11 young people in our program. Que están siendo cambiados por el poder de Dios. They're changed by the power of God. Déjame decirte, Esteban, que Dios me ha dado una hermosa esposa que canta para el Señor. Y ella me mandó para que te trajera de regalo este su más reciente grabación, que es La Vida Sin Dios. This is a tape from his wife that she just recorded. He wants me to have this as a gift from them. Brother? Tú dijiste unas palabras muy importantes. He said, you said some words that are very important. Y tú dijiste que nosotros debemos estar llenos del fuego del Espíritu Santo. You said that we have to be filled with the, with the power and the fire of God. Pero, de, pero déjame decirte que Dios es un Dios de orden. But I want you to understand that God is a God of order. Y dice la palabra en Amos capítulo 3, versículo 7. And the, the, the word of God says. Que Jehová el Señor nunca hará nada sin antes revelárselo a los siervos sus profetas. That God is not doing anything without first speaking to his men, his, his prophets. Y déjame decirte. And I want to say something to you. Que la palabra dice. That the word says que nosotros debemos ser agradecido that we need to be thankful y, re y que reconozcamos a los que trabajan entre nosotros and recognize who is working among us y que lo tengamos en gran en gran estima and we need to esteem the ones that are working among us y yo en esta noche and tonight los reconozco a ustedes 
I want to recognize you porque el Espíritu Santo because the Spirit of God siempre always usa un hombre uses a man or a woman para bendecir a los demás to bless the rest of the people. Esteban, yo le doy gracias a Dios por la vida del pastor David Wilkerson. I want to thank God for David Wilkerson. Por la vida del pastor Don. For Don Wilkerson. Y le doy gracias a Dios por tu vida. And I thank God for you. Pero quiero que me des unas palabras finales. I want to give a few final words. Yo quiero darle la gloria al Señor y la gracia al Señor por la vida del pastor Bob Philly que está aquí sentado. But I also want to give God glory and honor for Bob Phillips, that man sitting right over there. Yo quiero decir al pastor Bob Philly, I want to say to you, Bob, que Dios le ha usado tan lindamente en mi vida. That God has used you preciously in my life. Para cambiar mi vida. To change my whole life. Yo recuerdo cuando era cocinero en, en, en el aposento alto. I remember when I was a cook. Que cocinaba para 110 drogaditos. And I was cooking there at Times Square Church for 110 drug addicts. Prostituta. Prostitutes. Y homosexuales. And homosexuals. Yo iba a la iglesia. I would go to church. Y escuchaba sus enseñanzas. And I'd always go and listen to your teachings. Hay un mensaje. There was a message. Que posiblemente lo tenga bien archivado. That maybe you might remember. Que se encuentra en Primera de Samuel capítulo 30. That's in the book of Samuel. Cuando David venció a Amalek. When, when David conquered Amalek, y el tema de ese mensaje, and the subject of this message, es recobrando todas tus pérdidas, that he got all that he lost. Pues yo quiero decirle que este ministerio de Teen Challenge, I want you to understand that this ministry of Teen Challenge, Dios lo ha usado tan lindamente, that God has used trem tremendously, que me ha llevado por diferentes países evangelizando a través de este ministerio, that God has allowed me to go to different countries evangelizing, y ese mensaje recobrando todas tus pérdidas, and this message by, by remembering everything that you've lost and getting it back, Dios lo puso en mi corazón de una manera tan poderosa, that God has put it in my heart in such a powerful way, que lo he estado llevando por Centro y Suramérica, I'm taking it all over America, uh, Central America, donde Dios ha estado libertando, salvando y salvando, and God is liberating, he's setting people free, the captive are being set free, pero no solamente en la vida de los demás, Sino en mi propia vida personal. But not just in them, but in my own life. Porque desde de que escuché ese mensaje, since I heard that message from you, hasta el día de hoy, today, to today, lo que estoy es recuperando toda mis pérdidas. I'm getting back everything Satan's taken from me. And I'm not going to stop until I get into the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, we're taking some time with this, so tough. It's just the way it is. I love missions. You should love missions. Let me tell you something before Bob, Bob Rogers comes. I want you to come ahead, brother. Charles Finney said this. Now, tonight, I want everyone to give like you've never given before. I want you to give tonight. You're going to make your check out to Brownsville Assembly. Bob is going to explain this to you. But I want you to sacrificially give. Give something that means something to you. I said, give something that means something to you tonight, friend. But Charles Finney said this, and I'm going to leave this with you. Charles. He's ready to change lives radically tonight. And um, Steve's ready to preach, but there's just a, a short story that's on my heart I need to tell you. I planned on sharing it in my class this morning, and God completely took it out of my head. I just feel I need to say this. I don't know why, but I just want to say it. Before I do, let me invite every. Has anyone here ever been tempted ever? Anybody here ever sinned been tempted? I'll be talking at 11 o'clock tomorrow about how to overcome temptation. You might find it practical. At 11 o'clock here in the chapel, we invite all of you to be here. 11 o'clock, grab one of our brochures about our summer session, our praise and worship classes next week, prayer and intercession after that, winning the lost after that, signs and wonders after that. You can take it just one week. So if you're here next week or week after, take one of the courses with us. But I just want you to hear this. Listen to me for a minute. Everything we need is summed up in God coming in the place. God sweeping in. God taking over. I just want you to hear this. When Charles Finney was ministering in upstate New York one time, he received an invitation from an old man to come and preach in his town. And Finney accepted the invitation to do it a few days later. 
And Finney was very tired the day he was walking. It was several miles walk to get to this place, and he was wishing he hadn't done it. He was wishing he hadn't accepted the invitation. And when he got there, the meeting was in a barn setting, and he walked in, and something struck him that there was something wrong in the place. Something was wrong. And he, they went to sing a hymn. They knew the words, but something was wrong in the spirit. The singing was so terrible, he put his hands over his ears. And then it got so bad, he fell to his knees with his hands on his ears. Couldn't bear it. And he got up to preach, and God just laid on his heart, preach from Genesis 19, flee from this wicked city of Sodom. Flee from this wicked city of Sodom. God's going to destroy Sodom with fire and brimstone. And as he's sharing this, the people are getting furious. And he doesn't know why. They're looking at him like they're ready to kill him. They're looking at him with anger. They're gnashing their teeth, and he doesn't know why. And suddenly, about halfway through his message, he says a kind of shimmering went through the building. He says, God just came in the house, and next thing, the people begin to scream and wail and fall out of their seats. He said, if I had a sword in each hand, I couldn't have cut them down any faster than they were falling. Within two minutes, everybody is either on their knees, on their face, wailing, weeping, repenting before God. He screams out to the people, you're not in hell yet, you can still pray. But they were so overcome, they couldn't even hear him. And he finally sent the old man out, pray with these people, pray, and one after another they came to meet Jesus and were saved. He found out afterwards what happened. That town was so wicked, it had been given the nickname of Sodom. And in his message, he kept talking about there's only one righteous man in the place. That's Lot. And Lot needs to flee before God sends judgment on Sodom. And this old man that invited him was the only godly man in the place, and his nickname was Lot. And these people thought that Finney had been set up by this man, and now he's telling them God's going to rain down fire and brimstone on Sodom. With all that in their heads, with all that hostility, with all that resistance, the only thing that was needed was the Spirit of God to come and break it all. And in a moment, hardened sinners were radically saved. I want to say to you today, and I talk in the, in the, in the beginning of the book, what heaven is. And heaven is where God lives. Heaven is his presence. And I want to tell you something. In heaven, friend, you're going to do some worship. And so this is heaven practice down here. That's what this is. This is heaven practice. And so I just, that one chorus, Jesus, Lyndall, let's just sing that just for a minute. Jesus. Sorry, I had the right key. Jesus. Sing it. Jesus. Sing it. Jesus. Friend forever. Do one of the verses, Lynn. What a friend I found. What a friend I found Closer than a brother I have felt your touch More intimate than lovers Jesus!
Aleluia. Aleluia. Oh, aleluia. Aleluia. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy. You're holy. You're my Jesus. My Jesus. Holy, holy. Holy, holy. Glory. I really feel tonight, friend, that, um, that God is going to do a powerful work in so many lives. And uh, a couple things that I want to see happen, and I want to I preach just a, a, a message that God laid on my heart this morning. And then um, we want to pray with you. We want to lay hands on you. We want to pray for you. Um, I, I care about you. We all care about you. The prayer team cares about you. Uh, I remember a Catholic woman that came to this revival at the beginning of the revival, three weeks old. And uh, she said, um, Preacher, this revival is going to go on for a long time. And I said, How do you know that? She said, Because you folks care about people. She's a real classy lady. I remember how classy she was dressed. And you could tell she was from a really well educated background and uh, probably a very wealthy background. And, and, but she said, um, She said, You know, there's a lot of places where people don't care about you no more, but here you pray for us. You care about us. You lay hands on me. You pray for me. And you preach the gospel. And she just kept going on and on. And we care about you, friend. We want to pray with you tonight. But before we do that, I want you to hear the word. I want you to listen to the word of God. How many will listen to the word of God tonight? We're going we're gonna to preach the word in the, in the chapel. I want you to listen up. And I want everyone to pray with me. My message tonight only has two points. The introduction has eight. But the body of the message only has two. But I want everyone to pray with me. We're going to ask the Lord to speak to our hearts and to change our lives. Those of you that have pulled up the website, I want you to stop right what you're doing. Don't go anywhere else. This is where you're supposed to be. We have, um, for those of you that are unfamiliar with um, computer technology, I know most of us know uh, about websites. Our um, website receives 5 million hits a year. Uh, 450 to 500,000 people pull up the website per month. You think about that. I mean, it's great what's happening here. But when we talk about 2.5 million have been here, in one year, 5 million have watched the revival all over the world. They can, they're going to be able to watch this service in Bangkok. They'll be able to pull up tonight's message in Thailand. And people are being saved all over the world. We get the reports in. It's phenomenal, friend, what's going on. They can hear charity sing in mercy seat. They hear the preaching of the word. They can order materials. What a day we live in. You know, when the Lord said, you know, that, that um, greater things you shall do, I've never really looked at that like that, but I'm looking at the media now and the possibility of saturating the world with the gospel. It can be done, friend. It can be done. I want everyone, yeah. And if you... And if you've never done missions, you need to go to some of these bush countries and go out there and, and go out in the middle of nowhere and you'll see a hut with a TV antenna. <laughs> I mean, they'll be out in the boondocks, but they'll have some shortwave radio or something out there and they'll, you know, they'll, be watching, they'll be watching some video or some program. So the gospel's being preached. Everyone pray with me right now, out loud. Everyone pray. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus speak to my heart. Change my life. Change my life. In, your name, in your precious name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for a minute. I got this letter in the mail today. And it really has to do with what I've been talking about last night and tonight. Listen up, everybody. Don't be distracted tonight. I'm just going to preach for a few minutes. And it says, Dear Reverend Hill or Mr. Brown. That's you, mister. It says, really, dear, dear Reverend Hill or Brown. So, listen, Brown. No, it's or Brown. I am writing this letter in hopes that you will place this letter on your person while you pray and preach. That's why I'm carrying it with me tonight. At the revival. I need God to help me. I have really messed up my life. I was once anointed... 
I know I have seen what God can do. I am now facing the death penalty. And he names the prison. And he gives his address. And I look at this and I go, what on earth happened? I was once anointed. And he says here, even he has one line that he's, he was used in revivals. But now he's going to be killed. Gassed for injection, the electric chair. He's on death row for murdering somebody. And I go, Jesus, these things ought not so to be. Something has happened. Something's gone wrong. If you listen tonight to these, mess these messages, is what they were from the baptismal pool. If you listen to them, there was one young man named Cody. Cody, where are you at, buddy? Cody Corbin? God bless you, man. I remember you, buddy. It's good to have you with us, man. But remember, he turned to me and he says, I'm back, Stephen Hill. He says, Stephen Hill, I'm back. Y'all remember that? Cody was, how old were you in Tallahassee in the youth group? 13. And uh, we had a lot of young people, hundreds of young people on a youth group. Cody and his older brother were in the youth group. And uh, Cody heard the word. You heard the word there, didn't you, buddy? Heard the gospel. Fell on the floor and cried. He, got, he, he, had, he had opportunity to receive Christ, receive Christ, got right with God in our youth group. But something happened over the years. We went from there to the mission field. We stayed on the mission field until this revival broke out here. Years later, here's Cody at the revival, and you heard his story. He's been out in the world. He's dabbled in this, and he's dabbled in that. He's fall, fallen away from God, but now he's back. How many thank God he's back? But as I listen to these stories, friends, something's gone on somewhere, and I'm going I'm to try to head it off at the pass in this place tonight. Last night, I preached a message entitled, You're on Your Own. And just to give you a brief overview, I preached out of Philippians 2.12. How many were not here last night? Lift up your hand. Wow. I ought to just preach it again. But the word says this, wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, this is Paul teaching, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And the next verse, I purposely, Mike, last night when you mentioned this verse, I purposely left it out. Because it says, the next verse says, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Here's the problem. People read the first verse, they, and it says, it's hard. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I stopped last night with that. Because a lot of folks, when they read the next verse, because God is going to work in you, they go, oh, good, man, because God's going to work in me. I don't have to do anything. God's going to work in me. No, friend. Paul made it clear. He said, work out your own salvation. And we talked about that last night, about how life is full of training exercises, that you've got to work at anything you're going to be good at. Those of you that can play musical instruments, Lyndall Cooley is a phenomenal keyboardist. He's a phenomenal, phenomenal pianist. He's a great worship leader. But he wasn't born yesterday, friend. He used to travel with the Happy Goodmans. He's been around. Lyndall has traveled all over this nation singing the gospel. He's been down the road. He was raised in a church. Some of you that are here and you're, 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 you're of different ethnic backgrounds, maybe you're black or you're Hispanic, and, you, and, and I watch folks uh, listen to Lyndall, and everybody's worshiping God because Lyndall has a, he has an uncanny way of reaching everybody, grandma, grandpa, young whippersnappers. He can pull them all in. Why? Well, he was, he was raised in a black church. Okay, so he can, he can sing some songs that I can't sing. But the man, he, he's got a touch of God on his life, but he wasn't born yesterday, friend. He's got some history behind him, and it's helped him. And so there's a lot of training, and when you walk into this church and you hear him worshiping, and, and, and you, you say, man, you know, I wish I could be like that, and you're just now learning how to play the keyboard, well, talk to Lindell. He'll tell you to stick with it. It takes training. It takes work. Is anybody listening? And we talked about that last night. It takes work. Right now, even as I'm speaking, somewhere in this area, there's a football team in the middle of summer, 
At 9 o'clock at night, they're out in a lidded ball field tonight. What are they doing? They're tackling each other. In the hot heat, in the heat of Florida, they're out there grueling at night. They've been there all day long, maybe all night tonight. They're going to be out there practicing. Why? The coach knows in just a short while it's going to be game season. And if they don't put in summer practice, they're never going to make touchdowns. They're never going to be able to fight. It's going to be a grueling season. they got to get ready now. Training. And I talked about that. It's the same in the spiritual life. Are you paying attention tonight, friend? The Bible, if you'll read in the Word of God, the Bible talks about the life of a Christian as one who wrestles. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we are wrestling. We're wrestling against spiritual powers and wickedness in high places. It's a wrestling. It's a fight. Paul talked about a warfare in 2 Corinthians. It's a pilgrimage. Talks about in 1 Peter. It's a race. Hebrews 12, 1. These all have to do with struggle. I mentioned to you last night that my wife and I are in an, 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 a strenuous exercise program. I'm falling in love with exercise. I love to exercise. And I've never, ever loved to exercise, but I'm loving it right now. And I'm finding out what it means to exercise and how my body will tell me it does not want to exercise. How many have been there? My body will tell me in the morning, not today, Steve. And I'll say, what? He'll say, not today. Oh, you mean you want to rest today? Yes, I'd like to rest today, thank you. How many have heard their flesh talk to you? And then it'll, my flesh will even quote scripture. It'll say, bodily exercise profiteth little. It'll quote scripture at me. And I go, you know, body, you got a point there. But little is something. Get up! We're going to go in there, we're going to run, we're going to lift weights, we're going to exercise. And I'm finding the more I exercise, the more I work at it, the better I feel. And it, it goes into every other area of my life. People ask us, how can you keep going night after night after night? We exercise, we eat right, we don't get the right amount of sleep. I'm working on that. But I'm finding that you've got to work at it. And in your Christian life, you've got to work at it, friend. How many agree with that? Well, tonight, I'm going to move quickly to another scripture, 1 Peter 4. Turn there with me. Charlie, I want you to bring out those two, that, that one plastic container for me. I don't know why I've used so many illustrations this week. I've just, I guess I'm just in the illustrated mood. 1 Peter. Four. This is not for me to drink. <laughs> Verse 18. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, let's start at verse 17. For the time has come that judgment must come at the, to the house of God, must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? This is entitled, An Alarm to the Careless. An Alarm to the Careless. It's just got two points I want you to listen tonight, friend. An alarm to the careless. This is how most of us treat our salvation. Our salvation experience with God is like this plastic Tupperware container. It's like a Timex watch, you know, takes a lick and keeps on ticking. Or it's like this, right, this Tupperware. You can beat it up, you can drop it on the ground, you can throw it across, throw it, throw it across the church, and it's still going to hold water. Why? It's Tupperware. It's going to hold up. That's what it's made for. That's why I bought it. That's why I bought a name brand. It's a good brand. You can trust it. A lot of us are like that, and we beat it up. Our salvation experience, the Spirit of God lives in us, and we, we use it. We, we trash it. We knock, it we, we knock things against it. We're rough with it. We walk around like this with it. We think there's just nothing to it. We can run with it. We, it ain't like that, friend. It ain't like that. Your salvation experience is not like a Tupperware container. It's very fragile. 
I want to show you what it's like. Charlie, bring me that. It's a little different from this, friend. This is just a quick illustration for you to know where I'm coming to tonight. Listen up in the chapel. I want you to hear this. This is what your salvation experience is really like. Let me tell you something about this glass container right here. If I drop this, I'm not going to go home tonight. My wife will kill me. Let's take that and put that up. This container right here, I hate it when we use it in the house. Because the handle is blown glass, and it gets smaller as it gets up to the tip, so I'm scared to hold it like you're supposed to hold a handle. You feel like it's going to break off any minute, and Ryan or somebody, so when we have guests over, you know, she'll pull this out of the cabinet, you know. And I hate it when it's sitting on the table. I hate it. I want the Tupperware, you know. <laughs> and Ryan will say, Daddy, pour me some tea. And I'll go over to this glass container, and I'll go. <laughs> and I'll pour it so carefully. And Ryan will go, Daddy, I can do that. No, you can't, son. <laughs> I'll pour the tea. Does anyone else want any tea? And then all through the Thanksgiving meal, I'll be watching this container. Ryan will reach for a piece of ham, and he'll go right by the container. And I'll go, Ryan, watch it. <laughs> and it'll end up on the countertop. We'll take it off the table because Dad is so panicky over this, this. This is a fragile piece of glass. This is how you should treat your salvation, friend. It's precious. It is so precious. It's not a Tupperware container, friend. It is precious. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous to look at. It serves its purpose. It's awesome, friend. It pours like nothing else. I mean, it's awesome. It looks beautiful on the table. It's very, very uh, useful. But you don't trash it. You take care of it. I want to tell you something else. We don't throw this in the dishwasher. We hand wash it. <laughs> and there's, some, there's sometimes, I'll just take it when the dinner's finished, I'll pick it up. I'll, pour the, the, I'll take the tea and pour it in a Tupperware. Then I'll take this, and I'll hand wash this. Then I'll hand dry it, because this was a wedding gift. And then I'll take it, and I'll put it back where it's supposed to go. And I'll go, <laughs> it made it through a hill Thanksgiving. Well, some of us here, friend, this is entitled An Alarm to the Careless. And I want to say to those of you that testified from the baptismal pool, many of you were careless with that precious thing called salvation. You were very careless with it. It didn't come to you in a Tupperware container. It came to you in a glass decanter. And you take care of it, young person. You watch over it every day. You make sure that you're not abusing your salvation. Now, careless means to neglect it means inattention, it means not taking the proper care. It means failure to use the care that a prudent or a wise person would use. That means carelessness. Some of us, we get saved. We give our lives to Jesus, and then we just expect to live without doing anything more. We expect God tomorrow, you're going to get saved tonight. Many of you tonight, you're going to get saved tonight. Tomorrow, you're going to wake up, you're going to feel great. But you're going to remember that we talked to you about opening up the Word and praying. But you're not going to be in the mood. You're going to be a little tired. Watch out, friend. You think it's in Tupperware. It ain't in Tupperware, friend. It's in a glass decanter. You get up tomorrow morning and you go, Jesus, last night you set me free. You saved my soul. And now I'm going to get into your Word. I honor what you've done in my life. Is anyone paying attention in the chapel? I hope you're listening, friend, because God's speaking to you. Let me explain this scripture just a minute to you. Some of you that have never read this are getting weirded out on it. It's not a scripture to weird out on. The New American Standard says it like this, For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Scarcely difficult, this word has to do with a struggle. 
it is a struggle, and I'm going to explain this to you, friend. Now, some people believe these were prophetic words of Peter. Let me give you some history. Peter wrote this epistle 10 years before the destruction of Jerusalem. And a lot of scholars, a lot of theologians believe that this is a prophetic word from Peter. History records that the Roman military under the leadership of Cestus Gallus came against the city. And many of the Christians were trapped inside the city. And to this day, no one knows why he did it. But the Roman commander lifted the siege of the city for a few moments. He, he took his troops out of the city. And for some uncanny reason, he did that. And historians are still struggling with it, why he did that. And while he did that, the Christians escaped out of Jerusalem and they ran 75 miles to a city called Pella. And some folks believe that Peter was prophesying and he was saying, if the righteous scarcely be saved, they made it out. They're going to make it out by the hair of their chinny chin chin. They're barely going. He's prophesying, theologians, some theologians believe, that the, when the Jerusalem is sieged, when it's taken over by the Romans, that some Christians are barely going to make it out. And then if you know the story, one million people were destroyed in Jerusalem. They were killed. The city was leveled and the walls were torn down. One million people were killed. Look what happens to the ungodly. The Christians barely made it out. But I don't believe that's what this is all about, friend, at all. I believe this verse is much more deeper and has a more significant application than what I just mentioned. Scarcely does not mean, look this way, scarcely does not mean that our salvation is uncertain. Are you listening? Scarcely does not mean that your salvation is uncertain. It doesn't mean that you're barely saved. It doesn't mean that you're just sort of going to, you're going to slide into home plate and go, Phew. no, friend, if you're saved, you're saved. If God has saved your soul, he has saved your soul. We all know that Jesus Christ purchased our salvation on Calvary. How many believe that? And it is a gift of God. How many believe that? Not of works, lest any man should boast. The word scarcely, as I mentioned before, means difficulty. Now, I just want to explain with a couple points tonight what this scripture means. I regard salvation as something very fragile. It's very delicate. The two points I want to bring up have to do with our part, not God's. God did his part. Jesus came down from heaven. Last night I talked about it. You know, when the Bible says, work out your own salvation, the Lord took me yesterday morning to Gethsemane, that Jesus Christ worked out your salvation. He's saying right now for you to work out your own, but he worked out his, your salvation alone. He's saying for you to work out your salvation alone. But Jesus Christ, if you'll remember Gethsemane, young people listen, when he went to Gethsemane, all his disciples fell by the wayside. They were sleeping. And he was all by himself at Gethsemane. And this is right before the crucifixion. And he got up and he went back to his disciples. He said, can't you even tarry with me one hour? This is hard, man. And he goes back and the, the gospel of Luke, Luke who was a physician, records it. His sweat was as great drops of blood. He was in agony, but it was all, he was all alone for your salvation. He was working out your salvation alone. How many get that? I hope you do, friend. Because it would have been a different story if there was four or five hundred people standing around him, you know, helping him through this and helping him through that. No, he fought the battle by himself. I think it's about time for us to fight the battle ourselves. It's about time for us to do our part. The fragility of salvation is fragile. It has to do with our relationship with God, not his relationship with us, but ours with his. Let me tell you why this thing is so fragile. Let me tell you why Peter was saying what he's saying. He said, if the righteous scarcely or with difficulty are saved, my first point is this, and it's just a one-word point, rebelliousness. Rebelliousness. Friend, before we can get saved, we must first get to God. Many of you within the sound of my voice never make it past this first hurdle. You're talking about scarcely being saved. Some of you that were baptized tonight in the pool, you barely made it in. I mean, 
you should be dead. Did you listen to this brother that's doing this project down in San Salvador? The man was in a pool of blood. The devil had him marked. He was supposed to die. You talk about barely making it in, man. He had a salvation experience drinking his own blood. Rebelliousness. There's rebels in this room and there's rebels in the chapel. You're bullheaded. You're hard to get through to. You're difficult to reason with. God has been dealing with many of you in this room and within the sound of my voice, and you keep pushing him away. The Bible clearly states that God doesn't want anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. But you have got to do something yourself. He wants everyone within the sound of my voice to repent, but instead we rebel. We want heaven, but we don't want to be humble. We want God to wash away our sins, but we don't want to stop sinning. We want Jesus to watch over our household, but we allow filth and perversion to creep in through radio and television. Friend, it don't work like that. It doesn't work like that. God desires the salvation of man, but man left to himself desires it not. Though he is in desperate need of it, he's rebellious. I remember, friend, how hard it was. Would you listen to me? How hard it was for Steve Hill to get saved. I was a mess. People would come to me and share with me the gospel, and I'd laugh at them. I would laugh at Christians. I thought everybody was a hypocrite. And God tried to get a hold of me. Some of you may have heard the story that I told. I've told it several times. It's in a couple of my books about Dallas, Texas. I was at a park in Dallas, Texas, hitchhiking across the country. And I sat down at this park, and there was, a, there was a Christian rock band playing some music up there. And they were handing out free sandwiches, and they had a big bus that said, The Followers of Jesus. When I saw the bus... Just the names followers of Jesus was a stench in my nostrils. I hated that kind of stuff. I said, well, we're great, man. They're going to give us sandwiches and they're going to scream at us. See, we used to have to go to missions for food. We'd go to Salvation Army places and they would scream at us and then you, you, get, you get to eat, okay? And I would sit in those places and it was all just cookie cutter stuff. Here we all were, drug addicts, bums, prostitutes off the street. We were sitting there and there's some... Just red-faced preacher was up there screaming at us, okay? And I remember sitting behind a couple drunks, and one drunk turned to the other one. He goes, he goes, you know, man, if nobody goes up, we ain't going to eat. <laughs> and he said, I went up yesterday, you go up today. And I was watching this, and I had not heard that before. Sure enough, the guy comes up, and they're singing, Just as I am. All he wants is a meal, man. So he's, you know, preacher's going, Come on! Charity's singing, come on! <laughs> man gets on his knees, you know, and he fakes some prayer. Then we all get to eat. That was my life, friend. I, that's, I, it was, it was so, there was so much hypocrisy, so much junk. These were good people that were trying to do this, but I could care less. And here I was in this park, and they were giving out these sandwiches, and he was, the, the, the guitarist was up there. It was Jeremy Spencer from Fleetwood Mac. Jeremy Spencer had gotten saved. The, the guitarist, Mick Fleetwood, and Jeremy Spencer started Fleetwood Mac. And here's Jeremy Spencer. He had left Fleetwood Mac, and he was up there with his band called the Followers of Jesus, and I was ticked. I was going, you traitor. And he's up there rocking away. Then he takes his guitar and he puts his guitar down. And he said, many of you are just like me. He said, I was on drugs, alcohol. I've lived the life. I've been all over the world with Fleetwood Mac. I've been everywhere. We've got our platinum albums. We've done it all. I've had all the money, all the women, everything a man could want. I've had it all. He said, but I was miserable inside. I was sick and tired of it all. About that time, my heart was doing this. You ever felt that? Suddenly, I wasn't just at a concert in an open-air park. There's about 5,000 people there. But suddenly, he was going, you, 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 you. He was, it was like he was pointing at me. Trouble is, about four or 5,000 people were feeling the same thing. 
And he said, a man came to me one day. He said, I was in California, and a man came up to me, an old friend, and I looked at him. He was totally changed. He was a junkie, but now he was free. And he looked so happy. He looked so clean. And I said, what's happened to you? And he said, Jesus Christ has come into my life and changed me, man. And he said, he can do the same for you. And he said, I didn't believe it. I didn't know it could happen to me, but I said, I want what you got. And Jeremy said, I asked Jesus Christ to come into my life. And he said, he changed me. He said, I went up to Mick Fleetwood, and I said, man, I can't do this no more. I got I to gotta preach the gospel. And so here's he sharing this story. And you know, that's a cool story. That's neat. You know, good for you, whatever, man, go on. I get mad. I'm mad. I'm talking about, friend, when I got saved, it was a miracle. If the righteous, as those of us in this room, barely got in, it was a grace of God that we got saved. I sat there, my friend was going to get saved. He stood up, he goes, man, I'm sick of our life, Steve. I'm going to get Jesus. I want Jesus in my heart. I grabbed him by the nap of his neck. I pulled him down. I said, if you go up there and pray with him, you're going to have to quit drinking, quit smoking, quit partying, all the fun things. You're going to have to quit hitchhiking all over this nation. Have to, you're going to have to quit eating at rescue missions. You're going to have, you're going to have to... All this fun stuff that the devil lets you do, you know. You're going to have to quit hugging toilets, you know, vomiting your guts out. All this fun stuff. You're going to have to quit waking up in jail wondering how you got there. You know, the devil always reminds you of the fun stuff. He never reminds you of the, 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 the junk he puts you through. And I said, if you go up there, your whole life is going to be messed up. So he says, yeah, I guess you're right. And so we walk off, we buy some methamphetamine, we get wired out of our minds, and we leave Dallas. Friend, I want to tell you, I was rebellious. I said I was rebellious. I barely got in. When I got saved October 28, 1975, it wasn't because of anything I had done. God got a hold of me, and it was one of them last chance experiences. It was either do or die. Steve, you're going to receive Christ as your Savior or you're going to be a dead man. You, most of your friends are either dead or in the penitentiary. And if you don't give your life to Christ, I mean, it was at the, I was at the end of my rope. It was a scarcely difficult situation. I'm talking about what Peter was talking about. He said, if those of you that are in this church, those of you that claim to be Christians, if you're scarcely saved, you barely got saved. How many in this room would be honest in the, in the chapel? in the balcony in this main room that you were rebellious before you came to Jesus. Lift your hand up high. Look at this. Put your hand down. How many would say that people tried to talk to you about God but you didn't want anything to do with it? Lift your hand. Look at this. Almost everybody in the room. It's God's grace that you made it in, friend. You were barely saved. You barely got in. Our rebelliousness almost kept us out. If we're barely, I mean, we barely got in, man. I look at that and go, dear Jesus, I could have missed it so easily because of rebellion. Some of you in this room, you rebel, you rebel, you rebel, you rebel. When are you going to melt and say, Jesus, tonight I'm sick of running. Someone said that in the pool tonight. I was sick of running. A lady did. I was sick of running. She started preaching at us, one of the first ones to be baptized. That's my first point tonight, friend, is rebelliousness. I believe that's what he was talking about. We're barely saved. We barely got in. Difficult. It was hard to get saved. Carrie Robertson, you got saved watching your wife Shirley. Isn't that right? Living a godly life around him. Didn't want anything to do with God. But God got a hold of him through a godly woman. Many of you could share the same stories, but you remember times where your mind was so anti-God. Did you know people that are anti-God die that way? Look at me, folks. People, die, people are going to die tonight in that anti-God condition. They're going to die like that tonight. You didn't. You didn't. With great difficulty, you fought. Some of us fight. We claw our way all the way to the altar. But somehow we get saved. It's a miracle that we get saved. Once you get saved, you better start treating your salvation with respect. You better start going, dear Jesus, my friends are dying and going to hell. The rest of my family may never make it, but I've made it, Jesus. I've made it into the kingdom. You've saved my soul. My God, I 
can't believe this, Jesus. Thank you, and I'm going to cherish my salvation. I'm never going to do anything, Lord God, to grieve you. I'm never going to do anything for you to turn from me and be grieved at me, Lord Jesus. I love you, and I love my salvation. It's precious to me, Jesus. Is anybody listening tonight, friend? Boy, you better start treating it like this. God's put, us, he's put me on this thing for the last couple days for a reason. My last point tonight, out of two, 50% there. Out of rebelliousness, God delivers us and we get saved. We get saved. That's a miracle. How many say that's a miracle? That's a given. That's a miracle that you're alive. The very thought of backsliding out of that is beyond me. I said it's beyond me. When people say, pray for me, brother, I might, I'm thinking I'm going to fall back. What? Fall back? To what? What's back there? What do you want back there? Oh, Jesse Duplantis preaches a message, what in hell do you want? <laughs> if you're Jesse, you can get away with that. I mean, what is back there that you want so bad that's causing you to fall away from God? I'm talking about the difficulty of our salvation. We barely make it in, and that now we're in. You want to know the next step that Peter was talking about? I know he was. It's sinfulness. First was rebellion. Rebellion, it was difficult for us to get saved. And then we get saved, and here it comes. It was hard enough task for the Lord to get us saved. He washed us. He cleansed us. He dried our tears. He put us on garments of praise. He began preparing us for the marriage supper of the Lamb. The greatest task had been done. He saved us. But now we're dabbling in sin. I'm going to use another illustration. I'm just in that mood. Bring those two items out here. Here's what it said. Bring, uh, bring the fruit. Here's the problem. Y'all look this way. Everybody look this way. I do this because God spoke to me. He said, if you can get an eight-year-old to understand you, then everybody will understand. Okay? And we get little kids saved all the time. I get letters from kids. You wouldn't believe these letters. I mean, they know what I preached on. They draw me pictures. They, I mean, but here's the thing. Remember Adam and Eve? Adam and Eve's in the garden. And God gave them the fruit of the ground. He gave them, does this look good or what? He said, Adam, Eve, they said, he said, banana, orange. And I would imagine the first time Adam picked up a ripe strawberry. And don't you know in the Garden of Eden, they were perfect. And he put that luscious strawberry in his mouth. He went, my Lord and my God. I will serve you all the days of my life. <laughs> Bury me, God, in a strawberry patch. I love this. And God says, it is good, but have you ever tried a fresh pear with cold morning dew dripping off of it? Tomorrow morning, Adam, I'm going to show you a pear. And he goes over there and he grabs a pear. He goes, my Lord, I'm going to make me a, a pear and strawberry milkshake. This is so good. And then he tries the plums. Then he tries the nectarines and the tangerines and the apples and the grapes. It's phenomenal, man. They've got everything they want. They've got fellowship with God. That's cool. You know, just chomping on an apple, talking to God, fellowshipping with God. They've got everything. This is how we were all born, friend. We were born with a fruit platter. We were given everything we need, the innocence of life. This is it right here. That's it, the innocence of life. My children are right here with this. This is where they're at, just little kids. And I'm training them up in the way they should go. I'm saying, this is what God wants you to touch. I'm speaking spiritually tonight. These are the things that you can do, kids. And if you'll do these things, God will bless you all the days of your life. If you'll just do these things. 
But what happens? A little devil comes along. Remember the garden? A serpent. For those of you that don't believe that Adam talked to animals, you need to study the word. Adam talked to animals. He could walk up to a cow and go, moo. Cow would go, moo, moo, moo. <laughs> he could walk up to a skunk and say, you stink. And the skunk would say, God made me this way. He talked to animals. You want to know how? You want to know why? How I know this? Because one day Eve was walking through the garden and she had a conversation with a snake, with a serpent. And the Bible doesn't say the serpent spoke to Eve and Eve jumped back and said, Adam, get over here. A serpent's talking. She was conversing with an animal, one of the creatures of the field, just talking with it. So therefore, there wasn't anything unusual about that. She got into it with him. And he said, has God surely said you're going to die if you just eat of that tree over there? And he starts putting doubt in her mind and elevates her thoughts and said, you know, if you eat of that, you'll be like God and you'll do this and you'll do that. And here we go, friend. I'm talking about the one other area where we're scarcely saved. We start delving into territory, no man's land, things we're not supposed to be doing. And we start losing the presence of God in our lives. We start drifting away from God. And here's what happened. God says, you can have all this. This is all yours. But then the devil comes up and he says this. Come here. I want you to smell something. Mmm. He goes... He goes, French fry. <laughs> he goes, God's given you tomatoes and pickles, but I've got something for you to put them on. And he says, Whopper. <laughs> and Eve is standing by that tree. The devil's going. And Eve's going. <sighs> and she looks back over that bowl of fruit. And then this goes by her nose again. Everyone here knows what I'm talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You start messing with sin. You start touching. You ever heard somebody say, how are you going to keep them down on the farm after they've seen Perry? How are you going to keep them down on the farm after they've seen Perry? You know what that is? You, get, you, take, you take a country boy. All he's been on his whole life is a farm. A mule, a plow, a farm. That's his whole life. Then one day, he goes on a trip to Paris, France or New York City, and he goes to New York City or downtown Cincinnati or the biggest mall, wherever that is, in Minneapolis, and he goes, boy, it's a lot bigger than the general store. Man, look at this, and he walks into a huge grocery store, and all he's done is he's, he's plowed potatoes and, and all this stuff all his life, and he walks into a grocery store, and there they are, all these potatoes just there for the buying. Then he gets a phone call from his dad, and his dad says, when you coming home, son? He goes, Daddy, <laughs> I don't know about home. You're going to have to get you some, some hands to help you on that farm. I'm going to live here in Cincinnati. How you going to keep them down on the farm after they've seen Perry? How you going to keep them eating fruit after they've had a Whopper? <laughs> oh, boy. Sinner! <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, there's no end to it, is there, friend? There's absolutely no end. You try driving down the road. 
drive down the road, especially one of the city roads, okay, where the signs are lit up everywhere. And you're driving by McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, you know, every one of the, 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 the quick Pizza Hut, Domino's Pizza, Taco Bell. Drive by all those signs and offer your kid a banana. <laughs> How about an apple, Ryan? Apple? At a time like this? Apple? I don't think so, Dad. I'll take a Big Mac and a large order of fries and a chocolate shake. Well, John Flavel once said in the 1600s, he said the greatest difficulty in conversion is to win the heart to God. Remember, that's rebellion. That's the greatest difficulty in conversion is to win the heart to God. Then he said this, and the greatest difficulty after conversion is to keep the heart with God. Because of all this, friend, all this stuff that's gotten in our system, all these programs and all these tantalizing, stimulating things that we've allowed our bodies to be a part of, then suddenly God wants to take us and put our body under subjection and our body goes, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to, I want to be free. I want to do what I want. I want to eat this. I want to smoke that. I want to drink this. You can't do this to me, God. And our own sinfulness rises to the surface. Is anybody paying attention? If you would be honest in this room, you would realize how barely you are saved. Man, some of you men, you walk along, you strut, you look like just, just Holy Joe. Oh, I love you, Jesus. Oh, 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 I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. And then you drive down the road tomorrow, and there's some lady jogger jogging down the road, and you're going, just like that. Where did your salvation, where did holy, 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 where'd that go? Out the window. What happened, friend? You realize how fragile your salvation is. I hope you're listening, friend. You realize how fragile it is, how the devil can pull you away from it. How many know what I'm talking about? You can be saved and on fire one minute, and the next news, you backslid. You can be on fire. You can leave a church meeting like this, go back to the local hotel, sit at the Hampton Inn, and you're just going to snooze. You're going to go to sleep. You're blessed by God. You turn on the television, and within a few seconds, you're sucked into a cesspool. And the anointing leaves you, and you're sitting there watching some perverted movie. And then about 15 minutes into you, click the channel, you turn it off, you go, my God, honey, look what's happened to us. We were just at Brownsville. We were just on fire for God, and now this scum is all over us. This filth is all over us. I hope you're paying attention, friend, because a lot of us, we've experienced so much of the world. I'm not going to get into junk food tonight. I'm not going to talk about it. But I want to tell you something I'm learning. We poison ourselves. I'm telling you, friend. Some folks have already gotten me on this subject in the back room, and I won't stop on this subject. I've been born again when it comes to eating food. I mean, there's some stuff that I won't touch anymore. I mean, there's stuff I won't touch. And I've just, it was all part of just a lifestyle for years. Just years. You just sort of do it because you do it. And then you, then you read and you study about some of the things you've been doing to your body. Your body's a temple of the Holy Ghost. And you read the poison that you're putting in your system. I read to this church just a few weeks ago the ingredients to my, my child's birthday cake. And most people were blown away. It took me like 15 minutes to read all the chemicals that were in her birthday cake. Whatever happened to flour? <laughs> you know, milk, butter. Trying my best to find it in there somewhere. You know, artificial this, artificial this, artificial this, arti artificial cake, you know. We poison ourselves. I'm sidetracking on this, friend, but I'm warning some of you here. Your body's a temple of the Holy Ghost. Start taking care of it. I'm preaching to myself because I've learned a major lesson. Endurance. I've talked about this this week. Many of you in this room, you've fallen short. Now, I'm going to close in just a second. Remember, Jesus said to the disciples, he said, those of you who endure to the end shall be saved. 
Jesus knew that it would cost us something. He knew that our families and our friends would turn against us. He knew that as believers, a lot to remain steadfast in our endurance, of, we, that we knew it would cost us a lot to remain steadfast, to endure trials and tribulations. He knew it would cost us something. He knew that we need to take up the salvation experience. And once we came out of rebelliousness, we hold on to it. Peter, you're barely saved, boy. Judas fell away. Peter, you're saved. I love what Paul, I think he wrote it to Timothy. He said this about sins. He said, don't be involved in another man's sins. Boy, you talk about, a, a, I've never preached on it, but you're talking about a message right there. Paul told him to stay holy. He was saying, Timothy, you got it. Don't give your jar to somebody else. You carry your own salvation. Don't involve yourself. He said, live holy, Timothy. Don't involve yourself with another man's sins. How many here have allowed someone else's sinful lifestyle to suck us into their cesspool? And now we're contaminated too. I'm telling you, friend, our own sinfulness. Once we get saved, it's a miracle. But now many of us, we're barely in, and you know what I'm talking about. One minute you're on fire, the minute, next minute you're cold as ice. It ain't a Tupperware jar, friend. It's glass. It's crystal glass. You need to take it. You need to go, Jesus, I'm going to carry this oh so carefully. I'm going to cherish my salvation, Jesus, and I'm going to live holy because you're holy. I'm going to watch what I'm doing with this. It's filled with your precious Holy Spirit. My salvation experience is so precious, Jesus. I'm not going to break it. I'm not going to abuse it. If the righteous are barely saved, they're saved with difficulty. Oh, God. And I'm in that group. How many want to be in that group right there? The other group's going to be damned. Well, this is an alarm to the careless. I'm warning you tonight. You're careless with your salvation. You're playing with fire. I'm going to give an altar call in just a minute. And you're going to get on your face before God. And you're going to appreciate God. You're going to ask him to forgive you and wash your sins away. See, he doesn't forgive sin. Sin can't be forgiven. He forgives a sinner. Sin is washed away. Sin is washed away. So he's going to come. He's going to forgive you as an individual and wash your sins away. And you're going to realize tonight how fragile this thing is. And, you, and those of you that were being baptized, don't you let me hear. Cody, I don't want to hear that you backslid again, buddy. I don't want to hear that you backslid, friend. I want to hear two years from now, I want a letter from you saying I'm still going after God. I'm carrying that precious glass decanter. I've got my salvation intact, and I'm going after Jesus, and nobody's going to stop me. My sinfulness is not going to stop me. Nothing's going to stop me. Let me close with this right here. Is this clean water? See Rudy just saying, he goes, no. What is it, bathroom water? What is it? Don't drop it. <laughs> Do you understand this illustration right here? Many of us, look in, the, in this room, look this way. Many of us, because of all this, spiritually speaking, all the junk we fed ourselves over the years, many of us are going to have to retrain ourselves how to live holy. Because we still sample this and we sample that. You can't do that anymore, friend. When you come out of the world, you get delivered from crack cocaine, that doesn't mean you can still drink a little bit. You've been delivered. You've been set free from that. If you've been delivered out of the party lifestyle, that doesn't mean you go hang around parties. If you've been delivered from smoking cigarettes, that doesn't mean you hang out at the pool parlor where it's a cloud in the air. You stay away. You stay away. You will flee all the appearance of evil. 
Let me tell you, there's things I stay away from now. In the physical, I stay away from them. There's foods I stay away from because I know they were destroying my body. And there are things now, friend, in the spiritual, I'll never, ever allow Satan to get close to me again. Ever again. Everyone stand. Those of you, the chairs, move them to the left and the right. Thanks. This makes sense? Did it make sense? It should be an alarm to everyone here because many folks are taking their salvation for granted and they're falling. People are falling everywhere, friend. There's no need for that. There's no need to fall. There's no reason to fall. You look at the rebellious attitude before you got saved and you got saved, thank God, thank God you got in. Now you look at the sinful nature that you've got to constantly deal with, deal with it. Deal with it. Work out your salvation. Struggle with it. Fight. Act like men. Be strong. I've said that to so many young soldiers. You have any advice for me? I'm a young evangelist. Yeah, act like a man. Put away childish things. Everyone in the chapel, I want you standing. Here's what we're going to do. Charity, I want you to come join me, sis. I'm going to give an altar call. I don't want anyone to come until charity begins to sing. Everyone in this room that you know there's something between you and God. Look at me, folks. I've tried to make it clear. Young kids, I want you to listen to me. You children, if you're doing things against your mommy and daddy, your mommy and daddy tell you not to do something and you do it, when I give this altar call, you get down at this altar and you repent before God. And then when you get back home, you obey your mom and your dad. You obey your mom and your dad. There's some folks in this room, you've told some hideous lies. You know what that was? That was the food, the food of your old nature. But now you've been saved and you still tell lies. You'll lie sometimes when the, the truth fits better. That's hideous. That's your old sinful lifestyle. And I'm talking about the fragileness of your salvation. You're playing with fire like that, friend. God looks at you and... and the scripture 21.8, Revelation 28, it should come to your mind. All, layers shall find, all liars shall find their place in the lake of fire. That should come to your mind and go, my God, I'm playing with my salvation. I'm a liar and I'm playing with my salvation. I think this is some Tupperware plastic container, but it's not. It's fragile, Jesus. Don't you think he won't lift his spirit from you either, friend? The Bible says, Isaiah says, my sinfulness, your sin will separate you from God. Everyone in this room knows what it's like when you sin, God leaves. If you're in this room and you're backslidden, you're doing things that Jesus would never do, you're going to come forward in just a minute. In the chapel, you're going to come forward, and at home, I want you standing, you're going to get down, you're going to kneel in front of that TV set. Those of you listening by radio, you're going to pull your car over, you're going to ask Jesus Christ to forgive you. In this room, if you're backslidden, you're doing things that Jesus would never do, you can watch a program and see nudity and it doesn't grieve you. You can be around people that are cursing and it doesn't grieve you. You can even listen to a nasty joke and it doesn't grieve you. You can sit around gossip where people are tearing one another up and it doesn't grieve you. Friend, that's sin. Jesus would never do that. I determined years ago to never go anywhere or do anything that Jesus couldn't go and do with me. If someone invites me somewhere, someone invited me the other day to go see something. And uh, I said, well, what's it like? And he said, well, it's a pretty good, you know, it's a pretty good thing, a pretty good. I said, would Jesus go? And he goes, uh, I said, neither would I. Isn't that something? It was a Christian talking to me. I said, would Jesus go? And he goes, uh, just like that. Oh, but you go, and you want me to go, but Jesus wouldn't go. Isn't that something? What a pitiful state we're in, friend. WWJD, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? You live your life like that, friend, you'll, 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 you'll come out clean. 
Everyone who's backslidden, you're going to come forward in just a minute. Those of you that have never known the Lord, I talked to you tonight. You heard the baptisms. It's clear. Jesus loves you, has a plan for your life. I've told you tonight that he went all the way to Calvary. He shed his blood. He, he sweat drops of blood in Gethsemane for you, friend. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Tonight you heard a Buddhist. Did you hear that tonight? She said she used to be a Buddhist. She's not a Buddhist anymore. You want to know why? Buddhists get saved all the time here. You want to know why? Because Buddha won't do a thing for you, friend. He's dead and gone. But Jesus is alive. And he's in this room, and he'll save you. He'll set you free. He'll make you brand new. So if you're here tonight, if you're here tonight and you're a Buddhist or a Muslim, come and taste and see that the Lord is good. He'll forgive you. He'll wash you. He'll cleanse you. If you're, a, if you're a cult member, if you're a witch or a warlock, you're involved in the occult, he'll set you free tonight. But you've got to do something. When charity begins to sing, you've got to come up. You've got to come forward. You've got to come down to these altars and get on your knees. Listen up in the chapel. And also tonight, those of you in this room that are religious but you don't know Jesus, what startles me, and I've been here since Father's Day of 95, I'm still shocked at these baptisms when people say this, I have known the Lord all my life. And then they'll say, I came to Brownsville two weeks ago and I gave my life to Jesus. And I'm going, I've known the Lord all my life. I came to Brownsville. And some of these folks will testify from the pool. They've said things like, I've known the Lord all my life. I came to Brownsville a month ago, and God delivered me from drugs, alcohol, partying. And I'm going, known the Lord all your life. God delivered you from drugs. Something's not right with this picture. What you need to say is, I've known about the Lord all my life. And I've been in and out of church all my life. But I came to Brownsville, and I realized my sinful condition so those of you that are religious here, but you don't know God, you can go to hell with the baptismal waters dripping off your face. You can go to hell with a choir robe on. You can go to hell with a communion cup in your hand and a wafer in your mouth. You can be serving communion in a church and go to hell. Drop dead and go to hell. I'm asking you tonight, everyone listen to me. Do you know him? Do you know Jesus? Don't lie to me and don't lie to the Holy Ghost. That's a dangerous thing to do on this holy ground here. Don't lie to the Holy Ghost. Do you know Jesus? Do you wake up in the morning with Jesus on your heart? Young people, do you go to sleep at night with Jesus on your heart? Do you think about him all the time? Is he in your thoughts? Or is he just like a Sunday morning phenomenon? Is he somebody you hang from your dashboard? Or is he somebody that's in your life and he guides you and directs you? If he's not like that, friend, then you don't know Jesus. See, I can't walk this way without God giving me breath and energy. I can't make a decision without consulting the Lord. Today, we were praying for a young man in my study. He's got some decisions to make in life. Why did he come to my study? He wanted us to lay hands on him and pray that Jesus would guide this 16-year-old boy. You want to know what he's learned? He can't make it on his own. There's a God that's watching from above that knows where he's going to end up, and he wants his guidance if you're not like that, friend, I question your salvation. I question whether you even know him. You can get upset at me if you want, but if you're not infatuated with Jesus, I question whether you even know him. And if you're upset at me for saying this, then why don't you get alone with God and talk to him about it? Matter of fact, shout in God's face and say, that preacher told me I was supposed to be in love with your son. That preacher told me I was supposed to be infatuated with your son. That preacher told me I was supposed to be white hot about your son. What do you think God's going to say to you? Well, I'll get on to that boy. He needs to shut up. I don't think so, friend. I think you'll hear the Lord say, if you're ashamed of my son, he's ashamed of you. If you'll confess him, he'll confess you. That's Bible. That's Bible. Charity's going to sing Mercy Seat. Everyone who's away from God, everyone who's never known the Lord, you're going to come. The only thing that'll hold you back is pride. And pride says, I can't go down there. What will people think? Who cares what people think? What does God think? Remember, work out your own salvation. 
It ain't a buddy system. It's not two by two to heaven, friend. It's one at a time. You're going by yourself. I can't save my family. My family's got to go one at a time. Every one of them have got to work out their own salvation. I can lead them. I can guide them. But my son Ryan's 10 years old now. He's at the age of accountability. If he wants to fall into sin, he falls into sin. I'll weep. I'll cry. I don't want him to go to hell. But Ryan knows he can go to hell by himself. He knows that. We talked about it today. I said, where are you going? He said, heaven. I'm going to heaven. I said, are you sure? He said, I'm positive. I'm going to heaven. I said, make it like that. Go like that. You're going to work out your own salvation, son. I've taught you enough. Now go after God. Whew. Man, I can feel that. I'm going to give this altar call, but before I do, because this is Saturday night, I'm going to bind the satanic forces. And when I bind Satan, let me tell you, friend, he knows who Jesus is. Satan knows this preacher right here. He knows I'm living a godly life. The Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It's not my righteousness, it's Christ living in me. But the devil knows my name. And he knows when I use the name of Jesus, he's got to obey. He knows that. I'm going to bind the devil. And everyone in this room, you know you're supposed to be down here repenting of sin in your life. You have not been careful with your salvation experience, or you've never known God, and tonight you're going to get right with God. When I bind Satan, the shackle is going to come off your leg. That chain is going to pop off, and you've got a few seconds to step out and come down here from the balcony and in the chapel and in his main floor. You've got a few seconds, and if you don't step out and you know there's sin there, you might as well pray to Satan. You might as well stand there and go, Lucifer, you've got me, I'm yours. Because the devil knows the sin. He sees the sin. And he knows God's trying to draw you, and you've chosen not to go after God. So you might as well go ahead and quit playing games and say, Satan, I don't want to repent. I don't want Jesus. I want you instead. Because there's no, there's no gray area. Show me the gray area in the Bible. It just ain't there. Jesus said, you're either for me or against me. You're either in or you're out. So I'm going to bind Satan. Charity's going to sing mercy seat. If you need forgiveness, you're going to come quickly. Satan, I come to you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I bind you. I bind you. Loose her and let her go. Loose him and let him go. Come on right now, friend. If you need forgiveness, hurry, 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 hurry in the balcony. Let's go. Sing it, Charity. Come on. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Run, run, hurry. Where everything Come on. is Kneel unknown. Kneel at these altars. Kneel at these altars. I face the power of sin on my Come own. On. I did not know of a place I could go where I could find a way to heal Come my on. wounded Come soul. Come on. Come on now. In the chapel, let's go. In the chapel, let's go. He said that I let's go. go. To in his the presence, in the chapel, let's go. Come on, and come to on. the holy come place, come on. where his mercy come on. hovers come on. near. Let's go, let's go. I'm a running, I'm a running, How about it, friend? If the righteous, if the righteous scarcely be saved, that means it's by difficulty they make it into the kingdom. Where are the unrighteous going to be? How difficult it is it for them? Now, whether you've known God or not, this is your opportunity right now to repent of your rebelliousness, to repent of your sinfulness, and ask Jesus to wash you. Ask him to cleanse you. Ask him to make you brand new. He will do it. God is in the forgiving business. He loves to forgive. He's in a mercy mode. He is in the, he's in the mode of mercy. He wants to forgive you, but there's coming a day where he'll turn from mercy to judgment. Right now, this is a dispensation of mercy. Ask him to forgive you. Ask him to wash you. Ask him to cleanse you. Come on, hurry. Hurry, 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 hurry. in the curse of a lifetime of sin. Come on, come on, come on. They never come true. But I know that I know there's a place, a place of, mercy of mercy for, for you. you. Come on, God bless you, kids. He said that you could come into his presence without fear and to the holy place come on. where his mercy hovers come on. near. Come on, come on, come on, running, come on, 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 Will hurry. Be a hurry. 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 H
Everyone at the altar, keep your heads down. Keep your heads down.